we're talking about episode seven here that's titled how to produce the best water possible. This one's all about RODI. This is what you went and got certified for. This is what all of our CS team has books on their desk talking about water. This is our bread and butter right here and our core belief. Our core belief here, uh, this is the thing that all water will lead into. And it's not just RODI, actually. There's a yeah, bunch of different yeah. things, actually, that feed into it. Chemistry, all that. All right. The core belief on, on how to make the best water possible. We are not maintaining a reef tank. We are maintaining water. And a reef tank is just the result of doing that well. Happy byproduct. Yeah, I like to say these things twice because they're so important. This is the core belief here that everything feels into. If you're like, oh, I don't believe that, this isn't the video for you. If it is uh, <laughs> something you believe, this is the one. We're not maintaining a reef tank. We're maintaining water. And a reef tank is just the result of maintaining the water well. Right? Yes, absolutely. All right, so. A lot of what, Randy Holmes Farley mentorship in this in this section here. There's so many things actually, yeah, that lead into this one. Mm. So what uh, what do we believe matter uh, matters most? Number one. Uh, number one, what we believe matters most: uh, how to produce the best water possible. Eliminate the unknowns, and you know, let's just, let's talk before the water even hits our our tank. Here, we're talking now uh, water out of the tap. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know I can go get my public water report and I can read about all of the things in there. And a lot of them have you know, elements and names and byproducts and all this stuff that I can't even pronounce. Pronounce that I don't even know, you know, the difference between uh, this type of ion of, of one element versus a different type of ion and how that, uh, you know, how that changes the water chemistry and all that. Uh, if you if you want to save some headache and, and heartache and, you know, just frustration and headaches uh get your uh, eliminate the unknowns one of the ways to do that is uh like a seven stage you know we we developed that the we investigated the uh, the different uh resins the uh cation the anion and separating them and what do you have when you connect uh, connect them together what do you have when you have like a third versus two thirds of one or the other and how effective is, is it at removing you know different contaminants and uh chloramines and the whole carbon block conversation uh has led us to like a seven stage where you can just eliminate the unknowns so the question becomes all the time is like well why are you pulling all the calcium and alkalinity and magnesium out of the water only to put it back in mm. We're not doing that. What we're doing is we're stripping out everything, yeah. right? We're like starting fresh, zero TDS Pristine. water, stripping out all the contaminants, the pollutants, everything. Because the reality is, is you don't know what's in your water. And we do. Uh, we've sent our water out for uh, ICP testing. Uh, and like at my house, I know that my water's got arsenic in it. Yep. I know that my water's got tons of silica in it. I know my water's got ammonia in it. I know my water's got copper in it. I know like all kinds of things. And so, you know, like there's kind of this false sensehood to like a sense of uh, uh, that like if I could drink it, it must be okay for my fish too, which is absolutely not. I drink chlorine uh, and is it bad for me? Uh, yeah, but it's better than the black plague. Yeah. Uh, so, but the fish will kill immediately. So mm. there's, these things are really sensitive creatures. And one of the reasons uh, the corals and the fish are different than us is we have organs that are designed to remove these things. Your Filtering liver, out, you yeah. know, your kidneys, all these things are designed to remove impurities out of your blood and your body. Like a coral doesn't have that. Yeah. You know, it's too much copper, it just dies. You know, <laughs> and so uh, that is why we go to RODI water. That's why is because you don't know. And in, in, even if you did know what's in your water, you don't know what's harmful in your water. Mm -hmm. And chasing that down it's just like i don't and, and they change all the time oh yeah you, you know you read a one water report one year from your municipality and the next year if you went to go you're, you can't trust that the information you saw last year in last year's report is the same this year because not only uh, do they change like uh you know not, not only do they change some of those disinfectants and different things that they put in the water but also the uh the usda or whoever controls you know uh, what is acceptable levels of different elements 
those change as well. Well, now we're not starting to see that this is more of an acceptable level, uh, or we can actually increase this level. I can tell you locally a couple of things that like people don't know, but like a lot of times what will happen is during portion portion of the year they will actually just use chlorine. Mm. And another portion of the year, they'll add ammonia into the water intentionally to create uh, chloramines, and that ammonia will end up in your tank. Uh, and at other points in time, like in a drought or whatever, like the city here uh, will doesn't have enough water, they buy water from a neighboring city. And so what was river water a minute ago is now well water down the street, you know? Like, so... It's just not wise, man. Mm. That's why we use our ODI water here. That's why you strip it all out uh, and bring it back. Now, the seven stage, like 99%, or not 90, but 90% of people would be okay with actually just a four stage. But like once you start getting into really like, oh man, there are these weird anomalies of ammonia gas. There's weird different pHs yeah. that also affect the different, uh, yeah, I mean, ammonium versus ammonia versus ammonia gas. Yeah, like so, it's just peace of mind in the end. Well, uh, another point to eliminating the unknowns is once you, you know, if you can eliminate that your water source for what you're uh, providing your tank or making your salt water out of is, if you can elim- if you can eliminate that all the unknowns, uh, all of the variables for if your tank was going down, if something was happening to your tank, and you can say with peace of mind that. I have my water filtration, you know, locked in. It cannot be that. Uh, and we'll, you'll hear the same thing when we talk about lighting. Like I have my lighting solution locked in. It cannot be that. The tracking down what's going on in your tank when you eliminate these unknowns because they're no longer unknowns. You don't you don't have to worry about them anymore. You already solved for them. Makes uh, problem solving on your tank way easier. Uh, the next one here uh, we already just said, but uh, what's good enough for humans is toxic to fish to coral. So don't don't think food grade or any of that stuff really yeah. uh, is uh, actually 100% the same because right off the bat, I'll tell you, a human can drink uh, disinfectant like chlorine. We can drink um, uh, the amount of ammonia that they intentionally put in there. We can put a drink uh, copper from our copper pipes that they get in there as a contaminant. Just levels of lead All these things some. that would immediately kill, like so toxic, it would kill it the second that you put it in there. Yeah. Uh, and so, and then there's all these things that are just going to stress it out and reduce its overall health. That's why we strip it all out. <laughs> uh, uh, that into the piece that you just said, and then what we believe most, RODI water is absolutely safe. You'll never wonder. You'll yeah. never wonder, like, is well water good enough, whatever. It's always in the back of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Do I need to go get distilled, or can I use this, or that? Just... If you want to stop that question, RODI water. This one, actually, the next one is interesting because I bet you half of the people that are watching right now don't know this. Mm. What we believe matters most when it comes to water purity and how to produce the best water possible, one of them is that DI purges one TDS and or DI purges and one TDS is not one TDS. Now I don't know. How, uh, I've her seen the question asked a lot of times on the forums, on the Facebook groups, on our Facebook group. Uh, when do you guys, ch- and it's a kind of a general question, when do you guys change out your DI resin? I, I still see so many answers that go, I change it out when it starts to read TDS. Okay, so you need to change it out before that. It has, you have to. Okay, so the reason for this is like, and that's what I was told too in the beginning is, you know, you want to get every last bit of use out of the yeah. things that you have, right? They're not trying to sell you a whole bunch of DI resin saying change it out prematurely. No, this, there's bad it's stuff that sliver, happens. It's just a sliver, man. Like it's not going to make any difference to anybody uh, whether or not you change it out with an extra yeah. half inch of resin, right? So this is the reason why. The way that DI resin works is one bead's filled with hydrogen and the other one's filled with hydroxide. When you mix them together, they form water, H2O, Mm -hmm. right? And they both have a positive and negative bead uh, on there and they pull out different contaminants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and it happens to kind of like create a layer cake and it just happens to pull out the things that it has the strongest affinity for. And what will happen is it kind of trades the ions until it has the strongest affinity for the thing at the top or the loosest, actually the loosest at the top. And the number one is ammonia, uh, it has the loosest affinity. So it won't be just one parts per million of random ass stuff Could that's be, in your yeah. water. No, this is a band of ammonia. ammonia. So once it starts going, it's just gonna appear, just purge pure, pure ammonia. All of it. And the one right after that is pure uh, uh, silica. Yeah. Right. And so. 
what you want to do is usually, well, you definitely don't want to use if it says one. If it says zero, anything other than zero is done. But really what you want to use is you get a 10 inch cartridge. It's color changing. Color changing, man, like change when you got like a half inch left. Yeah, and right? when, the, when the band at the top is still dark blue and it's about a quarter of an inch or a half an inch, just change it. Or if you use two, just swap it out. Like, yeah. oh, I'm getting kind of close. I'll just kind of pull the yeah. one over. And then probably the safest way to run it is, yeah, you know, you, you might only have one stage of DI and you have to catch this thing before it's a, a half of an inch of color change. But if you have a second stage, just follow, just kind of going through as a, as a polishing stage or a secondary stage, I'm less concerned about, I don't have to be there. I, I, this might actually change over completely, but I do still have a backup like protecting my water from this ammonia garbage puke. The Pro Series of the Three Resins kind of does that too, mm -hmm. but if if you that if that if that way if you had to, you can actually use the one all the way and will like kind of purge. And I guess the risk is you're just kind of purging ammonia over and over again as you swap these things out. Yeah. But uh, you could use the whole thing over. But the more most important piece here is anybody that tells you you should get to one TDS or two few TDS and then you and use it. Stop listening to that person because uh, absolutely it's a terrible advice. <laughs> uh, uh, you should make sure to change it. Never use anything over zero because that last few TDS is the worst stuff in your water, in many cases, the most toxic. And we'll puke it all out. <laughs> uh, we also believe that matters most in another one. A lot of this stuff comes from investigating and investigating tests that we do. And this one uh, was one of those pressure matters and pressure matters more than you think you think uh, uh i mean you see on the the uh, reverse uh, the ro membranes you know it's a uh, 75 psi or 50, or 50 psi you'll get uh you know 75 gallons per day uh, you'll get a 98 percent uh rejection rate uh and true yeah but when you increase the pressure you have more effective filter you're actually uh increasing the uh, efficiency of the filter too. Yeah. So most most of them suggest about 50 psi is like if I had 50 psi, I would get the 75 gallons a day out of it, and I'd probably get the rejection. But it doesn't account for is really cold water. Yeah. And about 35 psi is where the thing just like stops working in any, any reasonable manner. Yeah. It will start. It'll go slower and slower, and then all of a sudden it's just like got. It doesn't. There's no product water reduction. <laughs> you know, it's terrible. Yeah. But also, even at 35, if you have really cold water, it's really like an effective 25. Right. Yeah, they test those uh, membranes at like 70, 70 degrees or 75 degrees. Yeah, don't most they? people do not have 70 degree tap water. No, no. Yeah. Okay. And so here's one of my pet peeves, actually, is you see like uh, a lot of the manufacturers out there like game the system. They'll like call it a 90 a gallon. 90 gallon per yeah. day. And what they'll do then is say behind the scenes, uh, 90 at 65 PSI, which almost none of you have. Right. Uh, like less than probably 5% of you have 65 PSI at, at the tap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's total false marketing. Like it, makes, It's a 75 gallon per day membrane, but the, it's marketed as a 90 gallon per day membrane. It's the exact same. It's membrane. the exact same membrane, 75. But if at, just talking instead of 50 pressure. at 65, mm -hmm. it's just garbage, marketing garbage. And so, I don't know, trust that person the way that you should because they're willing to trick you up front. But pressure does matter. And we've seen, uh, we've seen water production up to not 75 gallons per day, but as you climb the scale of pressure, 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 PSI, you know, with a booster pump, you start to see, you know, 75 gallons per day, uh, you know, 80 gallons per day, 100 gallons per day, 110 gallons per day. You actually make, you make more water by increasing your pressure uh, and you're doing it more effectively. I'm pretty certain uh, you, you have, the, there's an investigation you can go watch on yep. pressure. So just search RODI and pressure if you want to know this. But I think, as I recall it, if you got up to about 90 PSI, which mm -hmm. is about the limits of what most of these yeah. uh, canisters and stuff should hold, uh, I think you hit like 150 gallons an hour or a day. Yeah. Right? You can double the output and uh, use up less DI because it actually functions better. So mm. pressure, pressure definitely matters. matters. Uh, another thing that I believe matters most is understanding that mixed bed DI resin, the resin that almost everybody uses, yeah. is super wasteful. It very much wasteful. Another another investigates experiment. So in the mixed bed, the standard blue mixed bed that you get, we've used for years, I've used for years before we found the anion, cation, and uh, cation mixed. Uh, in the mixed bed, in your standard mixed bed, you have almost, is it 50-50? Anion cation mix, but 60 40, yeah, somewhere in there. But uh, so you have anion, uh, which 
almost always like 98 per 99 percent of the time is the first one to get exhausted and then you've got the cation resin in there which uh doesn't is not even nearly exhausted as fast and then pulling out different things from the or charges from the water but there's two things that play into that yeah. one the water supplies often have a lot of co2 in them uh and the co2 will just chew through the, the, the anion, anion. Resin. Yeah. so again there's two beads in there and all of a sudden, it just chews through one of them. And then after that, the TDS will go up and you have to yeah. swap it out. The second piece of it is the cation resin actually lasts about twi has twice the capacity as, the as well. And usually it's 60-40, meaning 60% of this, more of this one. And so the net result of this is you're watching actually the, the anion change, change color. Change color mm -hmm. And that's what you're watching go up. And you'll burn through all the anion resin. But... The reality is you may have actually only used maybe 10% of the capacity of the cation resin. But now you have to change it out because it's mixed bed and your anion's done and you're getting TDS. So here I am dumping and replacing a mixed bed uh, canister that has perfectly good cation resin still in it. Okay, so this if you use a, a, a DI resin canister like once every six months, uh, forget this message, doesn't yeah. that, doesn't apply to yeah. you. If you're burning through a canister of DI resin like once a month, this matters to you. Go get all three. Get a standard uh, cation resin, anion resin, and then a mixed bed polish on the end. And what you'll find is you only really ever have to change the is anion. the anion one, like maybe 10 to one or five to one. Yeah. And it'll like, it, it'll vary, but you'll find out like this stuff lasts way longer and it's way cheaper this way. And you're only changing out the anion resin. So you're not throwing away unused resin. It's one, one for one. So, and the byproduct of this is actually too, like what happens is the, pH in each one of these things skyrockets. Like mixed bed resin naturally produces a seven neutral pH, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's a lot of contaminants that are actually hard to remove at a natural, uh, a seven pH. So what will happen is it'll go into one of them, it'll skyrocket uh, the pH, which will change the form of many of the contaminants into something that is removable. And then it'll go into the next one and then it'll like drop the pH through the floor, mm -hmm. which will also change it uh, into something that a different form that uh, the resin can remove that into a, a type of contaminant as a charge. Yep. And then it goes into the mix bed for a uh, final polish. So the, the three different like kind of pro series, it's a more intelligent, it is less wasteful, and it will remove more contaminants. And one of the biggest ones is actually the ammonia gas. They mm -hmm. can, ammonia gas will go right through the membrane because yep. it's a small molecule, just goes right through the membrane. Also, it doesn't have a, an electrical charge, so it'll go through the right DI. through the DI in many cases. Uh, but if we change the form uh, of the ammonia, it'll turn into ammonium, which has a charge and, can and be pulled the resin will remove. Mm. So, uh, especially in a world where like, probably 50% of you have chloramines, which is ammonia in the more water. And when it splits from the, uh, the chlorine, chlorine a lot of times will turn into- Ammonia gas. If it's a high pH, it'll turn into ammonia gas. Yeah. Mm. So like here we have a pH of 10 in our water-ish. Yes. Uh, which means all of it almost turns into ammonia gas. Mm. Uh, all right, the next one. This one actually is pretty interesting. Oh is, yeah, we kind of hit that one too. Uh, all what, <laughs> I don't know if this matters most, it's, but it's helpful to know actually. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've been to all the shows and you know shopped for all of the membrane stuff. Almost all of the RO membranes that you buy come from the exact same place. <laughs> Dow. Dow. Doesn't matter what the Dow sticker Film is Tex. on it. It could be Dow made, rebranded for a different brand, but it's basically Dow. Yeah, and like even the ones that, like there's two things that will happen, or three things. There, there, there is some chunk of some off-brand stuff, but Dow makes the best membranes, everybody admits it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So when you go to the water trade shows, Dow, it'll be one of three things. You just buy the damn Dow thing. Or uh, you can buy Dow material and they roll it themselves. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> or they just put a different sticker on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is generally when they want to change it from Dow into a, a rebranded rolled one, it's only because they want to charge more for it. Right. Because yeah. the Dow we, ones are like commodity now. We make, we make our own so we can charge more. You put a sticker on it it's and like call it double, triple check to super deluxe or whatever, <laughs> uh, whatever. It, all of a sudden you can charge $30 or $50 more for it. Uh, 
Well, we're all coming from the same place. Still a doubt. Uh, the only difference, uh, you know, meaning, so, you know, with that in mind, if you go back to what we just said, you know, because you see one called 75 gallons per day and because you see one called 90 gallons per day, those are the two same membranes. The exact same. Exact same thing. No difference. Yeah. Just yeah. how much you pressurize. Uh, what's not the same <laughs> yeah, and what we believe matters most carbon blocks are not created equal. They are not the same. Uh, and we have CTO carbon blocks, matrix carbon blocks, chlorine, even chloramine specific carbon blocks. Uh, and then the BRS universal is kind of out of all of the investigating and you know, all the research that you did uh, uh, out of the other side came a BRS universal carbon blocks. Uh, one for the reason that more and more and more and more and more municipalities at the time are switching over to chloramines and the uh, universal one. Be, I mean, you look at it side by side, it's triple the thickness of a standard carbon block. You can hold it. It weighs yeah. twice as much. It's made, uh, you know, these will attack. Well, it can actually pull out the, the chloramines, can then break up that chlor chlorine and ammonia bond better and last longer than a standard carbon block. Okay, so carbon blocks can be made out of anything. It can be made out of coconut, coal, yep. all yep. kinds of different stuff. And it, so it's not like one manufacturer of a membrane in the world. They're all different, right? Uh, and one of my biggest pet fee peeves, and one of maybe the most destructive things I've seen the community share is uh, uh, it doesn't really matter, chloramines, yeah. whatever, without testing it or knowing it. And the only threshold is, well, I didn't kill my tank. Yeah. Uh, well, you don't even know. You don't know the problems you may or may not have had. But the reality is, is we've done the experiments here. We used a $10,000 Hawk <clears throat> machine to we monitor buy, it. Yeah, massive equipment, yeah. Okay, like the normal carbon block on chloramine specifically would last like 300 gallons, where the other one would last like 7,000 gallons. Okay, and 300 gallons doesn't even include the uh, wastewater ratio, uh, which means that you're you know like every 70 gallons you're gonna have to throw your carbon block out, and, like every water change, man. Every once in a month you're gonna buy a new carbon block. Well, and that's uh, you, when you think about it too. You, you know, a lot of people complain about my, my DI resin. My DI resin just burns too fast. My DI resin turns burns mm. too fast. Uh, I would go look at your carbon blocks and the chloramines in there because very well, like once that thing is spent. Ammonias, chlorines, getting through the carbon block. Potentially, it depends on yeah. pH and stuff and how that would work. But, you know, here's the thing is, uh, is the most destructive thing out there. So I, I will just tell you, we've tested so many so of them. Many. And, you know, it's funny. Actually, we, <laughs> let's just put this together. Uh, normally with the membranes, they would put a new label on it to make it more expensive. Yeah. So in our case, we actually went the other direction. We, we put we, our own label on a carbon block? Yeah, so the, I mean, we don't make carbon blocks here. We no. went to the best, we tested all of them, we went to the best ones. Uh, and then when I bought them, they're like, yeah, well, these are map price and they have to be $26 each. And I'm like, well, what if I put my own label on it and then I buy 40 foot container loads full of them <laughs> <laughs> Can we charge whatever you want? Yep. Well, now they're 17 bucks. 17 bucks. <laughs> yeah, not the other direction. That's <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, the carbon block, uh, the big the things, if it, if it weighs more, it's probably got more carbon yeah. in it. If you look through the center of it and there's yeah. a big hole the size yeah. of a silver dollar, it's probably got less carbon in it than the one that's got a hole the size of a pencil. You know, this uh, uh, goes back to the one of the first ones that we shared of what believes matters most. And, you know, just getting the right carbon block and understanding that not they're not all the same or they're not all created equal and they don't all work to, to the same efficiency eliminate the unknowns just get get the better carbon get the right one. Mm. Uh, and especially because it works in all the, the yeah. disinfectants yeah. and then yeah all yeah. right next one so i told you it wasn't all about rdi it's not all about rdi yeah. we're getting into water chemistry all right so uh what we believe matters most here Whew. salt mix if you can see the impurities with the naked eye i'd pass <laughs> Uh, a lot of salt testing happened in the, like two years ago. I think I did a whole just a, an exhaustive investigates on salt testing and uh, settling cones as one of the was one of the big visual indicators is when you mix up you know some salts or you uh, not even settling cones but you even look around the forums and you see like uh, people have in their salt mix station just brown crud and like I just cleaned this thing. Uh, this is a white container. I just mixed up a massive batch to 1.026. I had it sit there mixing for a, you know a day or so, and I come back, and there's just brown gunk. My my white container is now brown. Uh, there's actual physical chunks down in the bottom of the thing. Uh, if you can see the impurities with your naked eye, 
I'd pass. Hard pass. Okay, so here's the piece, man. Historically, and the answer is like people kind of like grasp on to a plausible theory and just kind of like spread it around, mm -hmm. right? So the plausible theory was that uh, the all that brown garbage in the mixing bin that you get out of it is actually like a, like some kind of precipitate or something, mm. right? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you though, we mixed up a bunch of salts of, of similar types of uh, calcium and alkalinity magnesium levels that mix up crystal clear, uh, Tropic Marin being one of them, uh, and doesn't have that crud. So why is that one not precipitating all this brown crud out? Mm. And this is what I like, this is what I wholeheartedly believe. Uh, if somebody who trusts me wanted an answer out of me, and I would tell you that what I believe to be true, it's that the sodium chloride is the number one source of contaminants, contaminants in there, your source of sodium chloride. Uh, and so like Tropic Marine is using pharmaceutical grade, which has a standard, is left to that standard, it's inspected, it, the facility has to meet that standard. Yeah. Uh, it produces a different result than what a lot of times they're doing is kind of testing batches. They're finding veins that are generally mm -hmm. pure enough when they're mining it out of the ground. But like when you mine some of the ground, man, it like, or even, you know, dehydrate the ocean, you know, to create these, uh, you know, salt ponds. Yeah. I think, it has impurities in it. I think the, that's the, what LeBron Gunk is. Why this one is this one seems so hard for the community or or you know non uh, for disbelievers to follow is that uh, uh, all all the salt mixes work. Like we've all had success on on the salt mixes. Yes, but we're actually going to hit on one reason why that isn't true in a second. But yeah. yes, I'll let you finish. Uh, but you know if it's not making my fish jump out of the water the minute that I do a water change, then I don't, I'm not connecting this uh, long-term consequences, if there are any, you know, those weird, you know, mishaps on why corals die when everything was doing good. What, what can I tie that to? Uh, it's hard to draw that parallel between, maybe it's the impurities building up in my tank from the salt that I've been using. So I don't want to get hung up on one brand over another one. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, like all these brands, people use to different degrees, you know, like, so like one brand's not bad over another one. Right, right, right. Because like what that is all about is just like brand loyalty. If yeah. you talk about the brand. But if I actually just walked you up and I showed you one that is crystal just clear. Bins, yeah. And one of them is full of brown crap. And I asked you which one you want to put in your tank. 100%, 100 reefers out of 100 reefers that say, I want the crystal clear one. No labels, no right. brands, no nothing. Okay. Then when I attach the price to it, and one of them's 100 bucks and one of them's 60 bucks, well, there's a different uh, question there, I'll right? Pay, I'll pay for the crystal, crystal clear. Okay, some people might just actually pick the $60 one, right? But then when I tell you, hey, do the math on the water change here and how you're gonna actually use this salt, uh, and then think about what's actually in your tank here, and that one is going to cost four dollars a month more. So forget about the sixty. The, the upfront uh, cost, the yeah, sticker shop. This one's going to cost five dollars more uh, a, a month. month. Uh, crystal clear. Never mind. <laughs> you know, I went back. If you actually have to process the statement, I mean, it's forty dollars different right now, but it's five dollars a month the way you use it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in that spirit, uh, I'll share a couple of things. What I believe matters most is there is a difference between a marketing claim of we're the best, uh, our stuff is pure, mm. uh, and a graded material. Yeah. And the race, also the graded material isn't just graded uh, to remove many things. The process of removing all of those things removes a lot of other things along with mm -hmm. it that are undesirable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's not, a, it's not a grade for, that's designed for the saltwater hobby. We're talking like, when you're talking pharmaceutical grade chem chemicals and components, this is a grade that applies to the all the industries or the majority of the industries that these chemicals are used in. So you know the baby formulas, the salts, the human consumption, the different things like that. Uh, a lot of those grades and standards hold true not just for salt water and salt mix, but anything that the chemical is being used for. All right, so I'm going to jump. Actually, we're going to skip one, come back to it, but I'm going to jump okay. down to one of the hard lessons here. Okay. Uh, okay, so. When we talk about ungraded salt, right, and like we're just kind of buying 
tech grade off the market sodium chloride. Mm -hmm. And then we know full well it's dirty because it's brown. I can see it. Yeah, I can see it with a naked eye, man. I don't need a test kit to tell me. Yeah. Right? Okay. And then the thought process, though, is a, uh, well, the brown stuff isn't killing my tank. I, I don't know if it's healthy, but it, it isn't killing everything immediately. Here is the piece that, like, I really think is an evolutionary thought process for everyone to consider. Because mm. there are all kinds of what I would call uh, cluster tank crashes, mm. right? You see it probably once a year, if uh, definitely every other year, but once a year where like all of a sudden some reef club or something will order, you know, multiple pallets of a salt from somewhere uh, at a special deal or something. And all of a sudden like 50 tanks crash all in that one area. Mm. Right. Uh, why is it? And sometimes it'll be there was like a bad batch in terms of like the alkalinity was off the charts or too low or whatever. But uh, in most cases, you could fix that. Mm. But in many cases, it's unexplainable. Like, you know, what what was it about that salt that all of a sudden killed 50 tanks in California all at once? Mm. You know, what was it about the, you know, there's very public tanks that all they did is like a water change and all of a sudden everything went really bad, you know, and maybe it was bad just timing. But also, maybe it's just, you know, the generally pure vein of sodium chloride that is ungraded, it has no standards, and nobody's checking on it. You hit a bad spot. Hit a bad spot. <laughs> you hit a polluted spot. And like, if, <laughs> if we just write that off as impossible, not true. Yeah. On a long enough timeline, is there mining, you know, sodium chloride out of the ground or dehydrating it out of the ocean? All kinds of stuff can happen. Mm. So that is why that five bucks for a water change of getting something that you know is good. It's kind of like the, the thing you said about the RO stuff. Yeah. Which is, I just don't have to ever worry that my salt mix is ever going to be the problem. Eliminate the unknowns. If you use graded material that is checked, uh, and not some ICP test after the fact. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about yeah. using the right materials to begin with. Yeah. When, if something were to happen to my tank, I can say, not my salt mix, because I, I purposely chose this one. Not my ROU, and not my RO water, source water, because I accounted for that too. Okay, so uh, also uh, in terms of what we believe matters most, this is actually really poignant because it, it depends on who you are and how you use your salt. Because mm -hmm. I use my salt differently than most people do. I don't know if most people, but many people do, which is some salts store better than others. A hundred percent, and yes. we can prove it and <laughs> because there's episodes out there that we did, uh, and maybe Adam or somebody can share, but yes, uh, some store, salts store better than others. And we're talking not only from a, uh, brown crud type, uh, you know, yeah. What we saw over two weeks of storage and four weeks worth of storage was some of those salts uh, that have, you know, claim high levels. So, you know, 12 DKH and, you know, 500 calcium or whatever it have may be. What you find is like after a short period of storage, I mean, it was 28 to 48 hours, uh, not only is there a precipitate building up on the walls in the, uh, of your tank or your storage top tank, two. yeah, in the top, you can actually follow the downtrend of the alkalinity. You can follow the downtrend of the calcium. And then there's some salts out there that do not have, uh, you can either, and, and I, we tested it. I tested it both uh, just sitting in a vat of water, no heat, no circulation, testing, uh, storing it with circulation only, storing it with heat and circulation only. And then time and time again, these specific salts come out as, they're not changing alkalinity levels. There's no change to calcium levels. There's no degradation to the uh, to those. There's no degradation like in far as precipitate on the walls. It just stores four weeks plus easy peasy. So if you're mixing up your salt uh, just to use it today, it really doesn't matter. Use no, whatever yeah. one you it's want. It's a moot point. Uh, if you're going to mix up a bat of salt and do 10% water changes for the next month or auto water changes, you mm. want something that stores for a month and isn't going to change chemistry the entire time. Yeah. Uh, and so we did a bunch of experiments on it and some of them actually do better than others. And like, you'll see actually double bad in some cases where when you want to store it and uh, the calcium and alkalinity does drop and you actually get all this crust, like white crust and stuff yeah. all over. And then you get the brown crud on top of it too. Yeah. And the nature of it is in, in an experiment, uh, experiment uh, environment where we've got really well lit glass boxes, we're using a little eye chart behind it. You can see clarity. 
you can see uh, uh, like all the brown gunk. If I got a brute trash can in my basement, it's not a good like. Well, I don't know. It looks, it looks generally clean. good, I guess. It maybe, looks like it's mixed. You know? Yeah. Uh, in spirit, uh, this one isn't written down here. Also, too, That's, yeah. is some of these salts absolutely mix up faster in a way that I wouldn't see in the bin mm -hmm. down there. But when I have it at, in an actual time lapse experiment, you know, you can see that like the Tropic Miranda uh, did it in a matter ESV of hours. He was um, almost immediate because it's all pre done. Yep. Yeah, ESV the the fastest one, probably with ESV because you're mixing in the magnesium first, yep. right? And then you're not getting any of the precipitate at all. Mm -hmm. Or I shouldn't say that's a strong phrase, but like when you mix it up all the way together with the magnesium first, then add the sodium chloride, and then add some of the other elements together the way that they're doing it, it mixes up the fastest. For sure. Yeah, and you'd be surprised because uh, here, here I was when I was first mixing salt uh, when I first started the hobby. Uh, put it in a five gallon bucket, drop a uh, Marine Land or, or drop a, a little MJ pump in there, and about ten minutes, fifteen minutes later, I don't see salt crystals. It's ready to go. Uh, none of the salts that we tested were done in one hour, two hours. Some approaching three hours. It's about that five hour mark where homogeneously you, you can see it's crystal clear. There's nothing left to be mixed. And then there's other salts that even after 24 hours never did lose a cloudiness to it. Uh, it wasn't fully homogeneously like, mixed. Yeah, 20, 48 hours still is murky. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, another one, is, is anything that has like the amino acids and stuff in it too, or organics, which is kind of, uh, you know, maybe good for the and an immediate water change, not really great if you want to store it for a month. Mm, yeah. You know? So uh, I would encourage you to watch that entire like playlist the of whole salt, salt testing. Like, it's test. just so good. So yeah, that's the nature of all this uh, stuff is coming not out of a belief structure, but after doing all of these experiments. Uh, yeah, I, I think that when you use these stuff again, like if I gave it to you and I actually showed you how murky it was versus how crystal clear it was, what would you if it wasn't a brand name attached to it. Just two tanks. I'd pick the clear one every time. Every time. And the one that makes up faster it, every time. It feels right. Uh, and so here's the piece, though, is like you'll hear that bit of advice or, or you know counsel from people. Like, well, I don't know. I mix it up for 10 minutes and like I didn't kill everything. It hasn't hurt anything yet. Well, non-dissolved salt can't be good for gills. It can't be good for falling onto the coral sensitive tissue. Mm -hmm. Was it so toxic that it immediately killed them? No, nope, it wasn't apparently. Doesn't mean that it's good. Because everyone that I showed you, 100%, 100 out reefers out of 100 reefers, if I showed you in a well lit environment, blind test, crystal clear salt mix that had been mixed for six hours uh, and with a salt that actually capable of mixing in six hours versus one you mixed up for 10 minutes, Randy style, uh, and actually Ryan <laughs> style in the path too, is. Which one would you use? Zero would mix the, <laughs> the, the, the one that's cloudy. You just can't tell because it's in a dark you know, bin inside yeah. of a brute trash can. Yeah. Mm. All right. Strong stuff. I know. Uh, <laughs> Clearly, uh, that's what is going to my heart. <laughs> it, uh, there's so much misinformation on this one. It's just not widespread. It's, it's yeah. marketing. It's, you know. Brand like, affinity is probably the biggest culprit in the salt mix, uh, you know, argument, the whole debate. It, absolutely, hundred percent. It didn't kill everything. Not good enough. My salt is the best because I bought it. That is a terrible argument. <laughs> <laughs> it is, man. I mean, we're that being a, honest with ourselves. That, that's exactly what people are saying when you say what salt mix is the best, and you see this bickering argument going on. The only, the really, the only thing that's driving that is it's because uh, they may say because of the levels, because it mixes fast, because of all this other stuff. It's because it's the one you bought. Well, here's the thing. Mix as fast is just a perception until you actually test until it you actually against test other it. things. And then you're like, oh, wow, that didn't go the way I thought it did. Yeah. And you're like, it, really ask yourself for a moment right now. Hmm. If we took away the option that you use right now that you bought, it, like that one's no longer an option. Just, and you you said, can't buy it anymore. You said, what is the best salt out there? You might evaluate it based on the performance of that actual salt rather than a brand name. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and like grades of material is yeah. a legit thing to actually, and, and here's the thing. The reasons that those other uh, buckets don't have the graded material on it is because they want it to be as cheap as possible. Yeah, and, and like, a lot of people think that cheap is better. Yeah, well, okay, dude, it does, it meets that. 
So in that case, if cheap is the most important thing, then definitely in my mind, Instant Ocean is the way to go. Yeah. Skip all the rest. It's like the cheapest or pick the best. One uh, or the other. Yeah. Every, every Skip all between. the things in the middle. <laughs> uh, 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 the ones in the middle are all just marketing. I think uh, I think it'd be great to just post those types of polls every once in a while uh, on our social media and all the way through is you know this versus this and not tell you anything about them. I mean, Which one of these would you use? Uh, that, and, and it's uh, not just salt mix. There's a whole bunch of different things you could do it with, too. It, it's obvious. Uh, the answer is already there. All right. So hard okay. lessons that we've learned. A lot of these hard lessons have come from investigative tests that we've done in here. I mean, we've got a, a library of videos on BRS TV Investigates channel uh, approaching 2,000 some, if not over 2,000 some videos, a lot of them being uh, investigates. And so we learned a lot of hard lessons. And uh, one of the hard lessons uh, that we were just kind of coming off the heels of here is uh, dosing brown garbage to the tank. This is actually a specific experience for me. So back in my first house here in Crystal, mm -hmm. my first tank, I would, you know, I think I was using reef crystals at the time. Yeah, I'm pretty certain yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so this tank, this bin, you know, is just building up brown gunk like crazy. Just been mixing. Right? And, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like, it's all over the bottom, it's all over the sides, it's everywhere, right? Yeah. And at one point in time, like the power head kind of falls off and like mixes it all up. It actually reincorporates all the brown gunk from all the other brown gunks from over the time into like concentrated brown gunk. Right? Okay, I'm embarrassed to say this, but <laughs> like, I'm like, well, I don't know, man, it can't be toxic, right? It's the stuff that came in with the salt, so I just used it, and it added brown gunk to the tank. That was stupid. Yeah. I, that was absolutely dumb. And and was, you know what it was? It's, 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 it's that mindset of like, well, it must be safe. It's made for a salt reef tank, so whatever's in there must not be bad. Like, nah, it's just not so bad that uh, the fish jump out. But if I make it that concentrated like that, mm. dumb, dumb move. Well, yeah. I mean, then, Dosing the brown. Uh, I guess the the, the moral of the story the, there is I the, should have just been cleaning the bin. So well, it's not that there. hard. I just in between use dump some water in there with some citric acid, and it'll clean it all out periodically uh, with a pump. And some I salt you have that. to do that more than others, uh, more frequently than others, and then it becomes a headache. And then are you actually if it's not easy, are you actually going to do it? And we get into that whole conversation. But yeah. the you know the dosing the brown gunk is something that I mean you. Can we physically, uh, we'd, I mean, we'd have to set up a long-term test for this, but uh, can you, I wonder how many tank crashes or problems in a tank are as a result of the impurities of the stuff in your salt. And it's so hard to point to because there's so many variables in how a tank could crash. Uh, but I would not be surprised if I mean, even some some of this stuff's like non-sol non-soluble and stuff. So this, it just sits there and maybe changes form over time and whatnot. So you couldn't maybe you couldn't even test for it in an ICP test, uh, but it is in your in your tank. But uh, one of the one of the reasons that this pops out to me that dosing the brown garbage to the tank is the first time I ever saw Chad uh, hook up a gigantic twenty inch sediment filter on our water mixing station right here. And uh, we would run that as a pre-filter out to actually filling up the bins or uh, running the hose out to fill up a tank. And it was so surprising that after a 200 gallon bin, that sediment filter without, I mean, freshly, freshly mixed, brown, like deep, thick, nasty, sludgy, a sediment filter is completely clogged and brown. Okay, so I saw that same thing, right? And I was like, well, you know, you, so if you mix up a single bucket of some of these salts and uh, then send all of that water before you use it through a sediment filter, it will yeah. remove a lot of that brown gunk. Yeah. And it'll be like slimy. There's so much of it yeah, actually yeah, on yeah. there once you remove it in this fashion. And all I could think of is once you see that, why would you ever want to use it? <laughs> you know? And, and then this is kind of the response, though, in this case mm. is... Uh, well, because here we get broken buckets all the time. He's like, well, it's free, dude. I'm not going to let, let it go to waste. True, true. And I'm like, well, <coughs> gosh, man, if it was free, <coughs> if it was free, would I use it after seeing the single bucket fill that entire thing up with slime? That, you know, just the only reason, thick. The only reason I used it, even if I saw it, is because, uh, I mean, everybody uses it. There's a lot of people that use it. 
It's free. Uh, I can't throw away free salt, bro. But once you see it, man, <laughs> once you see it, like, how? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I know. So even if it was free, yep. I don't know. Uh, so uh, one of the things, hard lessons here is, I think I already mentioned it, yep. clean your tubs. Yep. Uh, there's Such no reason acid. to let whatever that is build up. I will tell you after, it must have been at my own house, because uh, I'm going through a lot of when it was 360 gallons. Uh, I must have gone through 10 buckets of this stuff. And at the end of 10 buckets of Jacques Marin, the thing looked brand new. Yeah. So like, I, I don't have to clean it. Yeah. But if I was using something else, I would probably want to clean that thing probably every other month. I mean, fill it up with water, throw the citric acid, yeah. let it melt, clean it out, dump it all out. Something to think about, you know, to future proof your water mixing station. If you were going to build your water mixing station, have a uh, plummet in a way that allows you to do that. You know, plummet, uh, get a drain down in the bottom of it or plummet in a way where I can fill it up with water, mix citric acid in it, get all of that citric acid water out, rinse it and clean it, and rinse it and clean it before I mix my next batch of RODI. I'm going to retract actually. I wouldn't do that. I would do uh, what Chad did. I would put it, if I was going to use salt that was, I knew full well was going to contaminate the bin that I was using, mm. and it was going to get dirty, and I don't want it to like just build up forever, I would just get the 20 inch sediment filter, big the guys. big giant yeah. guy, mm -hmm. uh, and close loop it into the, the bin that I was using, yeah. and just have it remove it. So the cleaning now is just swapping out the sediment filter. It isn't scrubbing out the inside of this bin and trying to fill it with water, empty it with water, yeah. citric acid, get the citric acid out. Uh, sediment filter, actually. Thank you, Chad. I think I, I think <laughs> if if I was going to use that type of salt at this point, that's the way I would run it. Hundred uh, percent. You could also take that nasty brown, dirty salt uh, that was free and just use it on your driveway if you had to. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't know if it works that way. I don't know if I would. Uh, hard lesson learned. Uh, getting this kind of getting back to that DI stuff that we were talking about, and and this is how to produce the best water ep uh, possible. Episode seven of the fifty two weeks. Hard lesson learned from the. You know, for the last uh, decade or two decades, carbon blocks actually recharge. Yeah, that's kind of strange. Yeah, they basically, you'll use the carbon block until it stops working, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would think that you need to change it out, but actually, you if you rest, let it rest, rest it. it lasts a lot longer. And that was one of the things I found out when you, when you look at these things and they say, uh, it will last uh, 20,000 gallons or whatever. That's based on normal use, like in a drinking water application. Where, where it's I, on, off. Yeah, you know, I come off, up and I fill this cup. Off. Yeah. Yeah, it's not in our application where I'm using like, 75 gallons or in our ODI, 200 gallons to produce 75. Yeah. And it's been running for 24 hours. Yeah. It's rated on get producing a cup of water. Yeah. Uh, and so in a cup of water, it's constantly recharging. Yeah, you can get 20,000 gallons out of it. Yeah. But then when we did our test and you see that you only get like 300 gallons uh, of chloramine breakage before there's you know, that, that breakthrough, uh, well, that didn't give me anything for my salt water. You know, and, and another one in here is that uh, it, like, when they say 20,000 gallons, read the fine print because the fine print on a lot of them. Chlorine only? No, they, they say chlorine taste and smell removed 50%. Hmm. So it will remove taste and smell of chlorine uh, to a 50% threshold of what the taste and smell was before. Like, what is that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so like with uh, the universals, it's it's gonna remove 85% of the chlorine. Mm -hmm. uh, that is when the threshold of replaced it is. Yeah. And, and that's also why you usually use two is because the carbon block, none, not a single carbon block is 100% efficient. No. It will always let something through and that's why you have the second one. And that's why you do two. Uh, all right. Ah, another reason why we use two also. For the uh, chlorines, uh, chloramines create ammonia. And so again, I'm not going to bore you with it. Chloramines, chlorine, ammonia bonded together. Carbon block uh, neutralizes it. the chlorine. Ammonia gas goes off into your system. There you go. Uh, or it could be ammonium at a low pH. Mm. Uh, ammonia gas, though, will go right through the membrane. Uh, and that's another reason why you got to use a DI resin. Yeah. Uh, the GI resin sometimes will change the pH, just the, the mixed bed of the ammonia gas to replace it, uh, but definitely the three stages. I mean, there's some problem solvers that we, you know, that we didn't really hit on the, I uh, seen some comments on was the, uh, like, the which part, uh, like if silica is my problem, if uh, ammonia is my problem, if CO2 is my problem in my water, 
uh, you know, how these different things go. There's some really in-depth DI resin videos that that guy did uh, a few years back that break down all of the chemistry behind all of those. Uh, worth checking out if you want to get smart about what's in your water. If you want to find out why, watch it. If you want to find out how, all of them, end of story, was anion res or cation resin, anion resin, mixed bed is the solution to all of them. There you go. <laughs> uh, efficiency, removing everything. Silica, it changes it all the forms. Yeah, silica uh, busters is really just a little yeah. bit of cation on an anion and marketing. Uh, marketing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Charge a little bit extra. Uh, hard lessons learned in uh, producing the best water possible, assuming that a single water change is the same as 300. Yeah, so like when I'm using whatever I'm using, you know, for my salt mix or I'm adding anything to the salt, like uh, and this goes along with actually any chemistry or additive or anything. Mm -hmm. Like if I put something in the tank and the fish didn't jump out dead, that's not the same thing as if I choose to do that same exact thing 300 times for 300 times over the course of five years. The bad decisions build up. Yeah. Now, water changes is a goofy one in the essence that you're not always going to build it up because you're actually taking some out to put some in. Mm -hmm. But what happens is a lot of organisms in the tank will like take the copper or whatever and build it up into its tissue and hold on to it. And so it may not actually be like elevating in the tank per se, it's just the higher levels of it is slowly becoming more and more toxic to the organisms mm. in the tank. So consider that like that a single bad decision actually isn't the same as that same decision made 300 times. Yep. Uh, one of the things I wanted to hit on here with the chloramines and ammonia, if you ever walk up to your bin and you're like, hmm, smells this like kind of smells pee? like cat pee or ammonia. I've heard it a hundred times. It's because it does. It's because it, of that ammonia gas got through, right? Yep. That's the biggest reason to use DI resin after the RO probably. Yeah. Uh, I wish membrane. I had that answer when I was a customer service agent because we got calls on that all the time. It's like, your, your, your stuff isn't working. My stuff smells, it smells like cat pee. Yeah, like, well, no, didn't know that it was ammonia gas that it gets through all of those because it doesn't have a charge. Yep, no ammonium. Uh, and so uh, in that case, if, it, if you think it smells like ammonia, it does fix your solution. Uh, and it might be add DI or it might be add the Pro Series series. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, oh. oh, we already did the cluster mm -hmm. thing. So, mm -hmm. all right. After that, after how to produce the best water possible, what's next?